Now the membranes of all cells have many important functions. There are also membranes that surround many of the organelles within cells. All these membranes have the same basic components to their structure that allow them to carry out all these different functions. And in this section we'll look at this structure and how it defines these various functions. Now, the most obvious of functions is that this cell membrane is a physical boundary between the outside and inside of a cell. And it can control what substances pass in and what substances pass out, and we call this partially permeable. But it also has various other functions which allow the cell to interact with its surrounding environment. This includes cell recognition and cell signaling. It is also the base attachment for the cytoskeleton, which gives the cell its shape. In order for the cell membrane to carry out its many functions, it has a structure which is made up of the following components, which we're going to explain in more detail. Phospholipids, proteins, and cholesterol. Now the major component of membranes are these molecules which are called phospholipids. Now phospholipids are made up of a glycerol, which is joined to two fatty acids and a phosphate. The phosphate sticks up like a head and the fatty acids poke out the ends like long tails. Sometimes the phosphate can be attached to other molecules like carbohydrates, which would actually make this molecule a glycolipid, um, which is useful for cell recognition and cell signaling. We'll look at that in more detail later. Now, phospholipids are used to make membranes because they have very special properties. The head is attracted to water, it's what we call hydrophilic, but the two tails actually repel water, it's what we call hydrophobic. Now, if you place some phospholipids in water, they will naturally want to arrange themselves so that both parts of the molecule are happy. The heads will want to go towards the water and the tails will want to go away from the water. What this means is that they will end up forming what we call a bilayer where the tails point in on themselves so that they're avoiding the water and the heads are on the outside so they can be uh, close to the water. Now the phospholipids aren't bound to each other, there's no bonds between them, but they just arrange themselves in this order. And that means that it creates this barrier, this hydrophobic barrier where the fatty acid tails are, and water on the inside and water on the outside. The other main components of cell membranes are proteins. These can be positioned throughout the whole membrane, which is what we call an integral protein, or only part of them um, is in the membrane or on the outside or the inside of the membrane, which are what are called peripheral proteins. They have all sorts of functions, these proteins. They can form channels uh, through the membrane, which allow certain molecules to pass in and out of the cell. They might have a little bit of carbohydrate attached to them, uh, which would mean they are called a glycoprotein, which can be used for cell signaling or cell recognition. They could act as receptors for hormones and other signal molecules to bind to. Um, they can be enzymes, these proteins, which means that they can catalyze specific reactions. They can interact with other cell membrane proteins to actually bind cells together in what we call cell adhesion. So they give the membrane some very, very special functions. Now these proteins are dotted amongst the phospholipids. They're not bonded to them, they're just interspersed in between them throughout the membrane. Their cell can add more proteins in or they can take proteins out. And we call this the fluid mosaic model. So here is a diagram of the fluid mosaic model. I need to become very familiar with this diagram. It shows the phospholipid bilayer here. Uh, it shows the hydrophobic tails pointing on each other away from the fluid and the cytoplasm. And it shows the heads which are attracted to the uh, water-based fluid and cytoplasm. We've got various proteins. We've got peripheral proteins, integral proteins. We've got a protein channel which, uh, which will allow certain molecules, specific molecules, to pass through it. We've got a glycolipid. We've got glycoproteins. Those are molecules with carbohydrates attached which are used for things like cell recognition. There's also this molecule here called cholesterol. Now cholesterol plays a very important role in the fluidity and the permeability of this cell membrane. Some eukaryotic cells also have something called a glycocalyx. Now this is a protein and polysaccharide matrix which actually covers the whole sort of external surface of a cell. In eukaryotic cells, it's mostly used for cell recognition and adhesion of cells. 
the cells lining the small intestine are an example of cells in a human which have a glycocalyx and it's there to protect them from the physical stress of the food that is constantly passing over them through the lumen of the small intestine. Not only that, the glycolytes actually has some enzymes in it which is going to help with food digestion. Now the molecules that make up the membrane, the phospholipid and the proteins, are not bound together. They're not joined together by bonds. They are fluid, they can move around. Now it's very important that they don't become too fluid and the membrane breaks down. And similarly, we don't want it to become too rigid and there's no flexibility. So there are various things that can control the fluidity of a cell membrane. Cholesterol is the first one. Now the more cholesterol there is in the membrane, the less fluid the membrane is. The type of fatty acid is also going to determine how fluid the membrane is. Um, more unsaturated fatty acids make the uh, membrane more fluid because the fatty acid tails are kinked, which creates more space between the phospholipids, makes them more fluid. The length of the fatty acid tails also plays a part in how fluid the membrane is. The longer the fatty acid chain, the less fluid it is. Fatty acids with longer chains tend to solidify to form wax-like structures, so fatty acids with short chains tend to be more soluble. So the longer the chain, the less fluid the membrane is. Uh, temperature has a massive uh, role to play in the fluidity of the membrane. Um, if you increase the temperature, then the molecules start moving around more, the phospholipids start moving around more, more gaps get created, um, proteins then start to denature as the temperature gets higher, and eventually lipids will melt and the whole membrane will break down. Membranes uh, also, their permeability varies depending on uh, similar things. So again, the type of fatty acid is going to affect how permeable the membrane is to certain uh, molecules. A higher percentage of saturated fatty acids is going to decrease the permeability. Cholesterol again, the higher cholesterol levels in a membrane, the uh, less permeable it will be. Um, the hydrophobic portion of cholesterol fits into these spaces between the kinked hydrocarbon tails so that they can't move around as much. So the more cholesterol you have, the uh, less permeable the membrane is. And also the types of proteins that you have in the membrane are going to affect its permeability. Certain proteins allow certain molecules to pass through and certain proteins don't. The cell can add more protein channels, take protein channels away. So transport proteins, the number and type of them is very important in the permeability. Now in section 1.6 you're going to learn much more about a special transport protein called the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator. Uh, it's much easier to just refer to it as CFTR. What it does, the CFTR, is it makes sure that mucus, which is produced by cells um, in the respiratory, digestive and reproductive systems, is just the right level of stickiness. We don't want mucus that is too thick and sticky, but you also don't want mucus that is too watery. Now mutations uh, of the CFTR gene lead to a disease called cystic fibrosis, and that's what you're going to learn more about in section 1.6. Now how this CFTR protein works, first of all, is that it inhibits the transport of sodium ions into the cell. So sodiums build up in the mucus. Also, um, what, hap what the CFTR does is it opens to allow chloride ions to pass out of the cell and they also build up in the mucus. Now where you have lots of sodium and chloride, which basically means it's very salty, you will also have, uh, want to have more water. Water will move to a more salty region by osmosis. So water is then going to move out of the cell and into the uh, mucus itself. And what this does is it stops the mucus from getting too thick. If the mucus is getting too watery, then that CFTR uh, channel can close and stop chloride ions passing out. It will also uh, help the sodium channel to open again and sodiums to move in and therefore water will move in. So it can either open or close to control the levels of salt in the mucus, which will in turn control the amount of water in the mucus. Now these processes of molecules moving in and out will make a lot more sense uh, once you've watched the next video on transport across membranes.